Tom. So as Tom said, today I'm going to talk about are you getting the most from your genetics and how to make your next RAM purchase a good one. So I want to start with the fact that our biological system is designed to adapt. Every time a mating happens, even between the same two animals, the genes come together in a different way. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not, it's a random assortment. And so the term survival of the fittest really just means that the assortment of genes that survive get to reproduce and over generations, we get adaption. And so this helps our systems adapt if our environments change. The other thing that causes change is mutations. So when cells reproduce, and in a sheep DNA, there's 2.9 billion base pairs, every now and then there's a mistake, right? And so those base pairs come together just a little differently. And so when that happens, it's called a mutation. And this, again, is just another sort of tool that the biological system has to help the animal adapt. And so the mutation thing is kind of interesting right now because we're living in the COVID world and, you know, we're talking about variants. And when they talk about these variants, basically it's the same system and the same kind of mutation has happened to help the virus survive. So what this all means is that genetics changes with every breeding. And so even if we try and keep things the same, use the same use, the same rams, do the same breedings, the results won't be exactly the same each time. And as a result, genetics is something that we need to monitor so that we know what's changing. How much? And so how much does this matter and how fast does it change? And we have some control over this, but I'm just going to talk about a few things that that relate to it and you can get an idea of how how that might look. And so what has the biggest impact on the genetic of your flocks? You're making decisions about ewes, you're choosing replacement ewe lambs, you're selecting rams. And when it comes down to it, the decision with the biggest impact on genetics is your choice of ram. And so why is that? The first thing is that they're bred to groups of ewes. So you've got one ram and his genetics being spread to a lot more lambs than an individual ewe would, would influence or even um, when you choose replacement ewes. Because, so in a small flock with one ram, the ram will make up half the genetics of all the progeny. So then, if you keep replacement ewe lambs, you'll need a new ram to make sure you keep your inbreeding low. And then if you want to keep replacements from that cross, you're going to need a new ram again. And so at this point, this animal here is now seven eighths of the genetics has come from all three of these rams that you've chosen, right? So I've chosen three rams and seven eighths of the genetics in this animal here is from the rams. So this is why the ram is the most important, right? Is because his influence, if you're keeping replacement use, is very large. So yes, rams have a big impact. As a result, you need to put as much time into planning and selecting a ram as you might for use. And so what breed, what breed you're gonna use is gonna depend on your production system and your market. And so for this talk, I'm gonna assume that you know what breed you wanna use. And mostly what we're gonna talk about is finding a functional and profitable ram. So buying a ram is an opportunity to make change in your operation. Changes to market lambs or changes to replacement females. What are you gonna measure? How good the ram is in your flock? 
Um, what kind of production targets are you aiming for? It could be things like more lambs, less labor, faster growth, um, less mortality, more milk production. So we need to consider what we want the ram for. Is his main purpose to produce market lambs or to produce replacement ewe lambs? And for most operations, you would pick different rams for these purposes. If you're just starting out, you might only need one ram and you're building your flock, then you should buy a ram with good traits for replacement ewe lambs. In commercial lamb production, it's not realistic to, to expect one ram to do everything. For example, you can't have an animal that produces the most milk who also has the biggest muscles. Selecting a ram is all about genetics. And so I think it's worth thinking for a moment about the history of genetic selection. And so active selection started in the 1970s. And so this, or 1970s, 1700s. And so it's this point in time where people started to think, hey, maybe we should decide who breeds who, instead of just, you know, they're running wild and whatever happens, happens. And so then in the 1800s, it moved to keeping herd books and developing breeds, which led to shows in the early 1900s. And then by the time we get to the 1960s, we started to get into um, artificial insemination and keeping statistics on animals to help us guide our choices. And then as we've moved into the 2000s, we're into molecular genetics and genomics type work. And so each new tool, as we go through history, has improved the the accuracy of selection as a whole and our ability to choose the animals um, that we want to change specific traits. So when we select a ram, we're using an assortment of tools that have been developed over the last 300 years or so. I like to think there's three main considerations when you're selecting a ram. There's health, confirmation and performance. And so confirmation relates to the kind of selection that was being done at the time of making breeds and evaluating animals in shows. And performance relates to the things that we're trying to measure with statistics and molecular genetics for the most part. So why a three-legged stool? And here, if you take away any of these legs, the stool falls over. And so all, of, all three of these things have equal importance. Good conformation is going to ensure that the animal has a physical structure to perform well. Good health ensures that the animal doesn't have chronic diseases that prevent good performance. And performance is some measure of the animal's genetic ability to do the job that needs to be done. And so in loose terms, Health and conformation are what makes a ram functional. And if a ram isn't functional, he's not going to do the job that you need. So first of all, on the health side, you want to avoid bringing home any new health problems. Some flocks belong to health monitoring programs like the Mady Visna program. Many flocks are closed, meaning they don't bring live animals into the flock. Some flocks just bring in rams. All flocks have health challenges of some sort. And you need to ask questions to determine if a ram can potentially introduce a problem that you don't already have. It's important to examine the ram to make sure there's no obvious infection like runny eyes or runny nose or sign of diarrhea. Um, even if the ram looks good, when you bring them home, make sure you do the standard quarantine. Quarantine the ram for 30 days. This gives you a chance to avoid introducing antimicrobial resistant parasites, to treat the ram for foot rot, to vaccinate, and to observe for some signs of disease that could, or sickness that could have been developing. And ideally, you'd make up a standard protocol that you do based on your own operation with your vet to reduce the chances of introducing any new disease. The other part of being functional is basic confirmation. 
confirmation isn't just about how beautiful the animal is or how long the ears are. It's about structural soundness and choosing animals that are strong and able to do the job needed. And so confirmation traits tend to be quite heritable. They easily pass to the next generation. And so if you choose, if you choose an animal with a structural defect, and then start keeping replacements from him, there's a good chance that you're gonna see those structural defects turn up in a larger number of lambs. And so I'm gonna talk about a few areas of confirmation that people maybe already know, but it's worth thinking about as a reminder. And so just before I start, I wanna mention that the Canadian Sheep Breeders Association has an excellent guide to breeding stock selection booklet. It's very good at describing good confirmation. And this picture here and the ones that I'm using on the following slides are from the booklet. Uh, download it from their, the association website and have a look at the full explanations. So mouth and teeth, as shown in the middle picture, the, the bottom teeth here should meet the top pad. And if it doesn't meet, then you're into an undershot situation or an overshot situation. And with sheep, um, or at least sheep I've seen, I more commonly see this overshot situation. And in the case of this goat picture here, um, you can see the teeth. And so to be able to see her teeth like that, this is very bad. Um, and so this is really important and it's important because um, this affects how well the animal can eat, right? They need to be able to eat efficiently, especially your ewes if they're pregnant, carrying lots of lambs, they need to be able to consume quite a bit of feed without using too much energy. Um, and so you don't want to create a flock of sheep that have trouble eating. And the only way to know this for sure is to put your hands on that animal and feel those teeth. Heart girth capacity is important to ensure the ram has adequate body capacity. The animal needs room to house not only the organs, but the rumen and the feed has to all fit in there. And so they need space um, in the rumen so, so that they can have a lot of feed in there without putting pressure on the heart and lungs. So different breeds might have slightly different body structures, but regardless of breed, you don't wanna select an animal like this with a very small heart girth capacity. And notice, like notice this is very tiny here and it's, they're so narrow here that the front legs are touching. And so this also prevents the legs from sitting squarely under the body. When you get to this animal, you see how nice and square these legs sit. And there's lots of room here um, to fit a room and, and still have space for heart and lungs. So the back and the rump. The back should be relatively flat. Um, you wanna run your hand down the back. And what you're looking for really is that that you don't feel something like this, right? You don't want this weakness in the shoulder and a, um, an odd sort of lump happening over the back. Um, the other thing is the, the slope between the hip bones and the rear of the animal. And so in this animal here, you can see there's a bit of a slope, but it's not extreme. In this one, it's much more extreme. And so the reason why this is important is you have to think about lambs being born. And so in this, in this animal here, this lamb is coming from this part of the body. It's got to navigate around here and get turned and come out. This animal here, it's much easier, right? There's not such a big curve to get caught on or to have issues with um, when they're trying to lamb. So pasterns, um, pasterns, you know, this, this foot here is, is a good foot, right? You've got a nice angle on the pastern. Um, this animal over here, see this part back here? This is weak. As this animal gets older, 
this is going to drop towards the ground and they're going to look you know a little bit like they have skis for feet um, this animal here it's better than having this situation but it's a little bit too straight um, this ideal or you know pastern that you'd like to choose has enough angle that it, it absorbs impact when they're walking where this one um, it really pounds on their joints more than than this foot would here and so so these things are important so that they don't have foot pain pasterns can also be crooked in how they attach to the front leg and this picture here on the left shows a pretty extreme version of what can happen um, if you don't if you're not trying to actively select animals and make sure that their their legs are relatively straight and correctly attached you can start to get animals that are born with this kind of problem um, which uh, which isn't good for anyone the other thing is that they should you know these pasterns should point straight ahead in this case you can see the different the knee is pointing straight ahead here and the foot is angling out so so front legs what you really want is this situation here you want the legs to be squarely under the shoulders you want everything pointing the same way and then they are they have a nice strong base um, to carry themselves ar around on they're not as likely to have any problems um, particularly in a, in a ram you don't want him to have sore legs if he's got sore feet sore legs anything like that that's uncomfortable he's not going to want to breed as many ewes as one who uh, feels fit and uh, and good and so you can see some other things that can happen here. You can see how you can get legs, they're angling inwards. You can get some that are sitting outside the shoulders, um, or you can get it, these uh, knees bending in as well. And uh, all of these situations are back to the same old thing is they're, they're not gonna last as long. They're gonna start having, uh, having some issues. So hind legs, the back legs should line up under the hips. And so in this picture here, you can see how the hawks line up nicely under, under the hips and the feet are facing forward and everything's uh, lined up quite well. Here, um, they've slated this one as desirable and you see these, neat, these back hawks coming together. I really don't like that. Um, it could be like in this case this is a weird picture this animal is standing over top of another animal and he may not have um all of his weight properly you know set on all four feet and so you know it could be that when the animal stands up correctly on all, with its weight on all four feet that these hawks straighten up a bit and so if they straighten up a bit that's fine um but if they are like this with all four, like with weight on all four feet, um, that's not that great either. Because again, you have to think of that ram has to jump up onto a ewe to breed, and it's not gonna be as easy for him if he's got this situation. But the other thing to realize is that uh, a lot of animals will stand like this, but they'll be, they'll have their weight shifted a little bit to one side um, and they'll, they'll have weight on you know, three legs rather than four. And in this case here, we've got the situation where we've got the hawks outside of the hips. And again, um, they're gonna have some trouble uh, breeding ewes. So the last area I wanna talk about is reproduction because that's really what we're, we're buying the ram for. Um, so don't forget to check the testicles, you know, just glancing and saying, yeah, they have some isn't quite good enough. Um, you need to make sure that there's two, um, that there's two testicles and they're, that they're roughly the same size. And that means you're going to have to put your hands on them. It's not always easy to tell for sure. So what you want to do is you want to start with your hands on one on each side of the testicles 
and you want to feel the spermatic cords up here where it attaches to the body and then gradually bring your hands down um, all the way to the bottom and you're feeling for um, possible lumps and you're feeling if they're firm. If the, if the testes are a bit soft, it can indicate that they've had some infection, that they've had some heat stress or nutritional problems, and that there's currently not much sperm production going on there. So um, if you need to use him within the next couple of months, you want to make sure that, that those testicles feel firm. Um, you also want to make sure that they're um, an adequate size. Um, because in sheep, the size of the testicles is directly related to how much sperm that ram can produce. So if they have smaller testicles um, like this, they can't produce as much sperm as this animal here does. And this animal here really has got a problem. He's not going to have that much sperm production at all at this point in time. And so rams with smaller testicles won't be able to breed as many ewes, and especially out of season, because out of season, um, they're gonna, their testicle size is going to reduce because they're producing less sperm. And so you'll see that difference in your rams. Um, and it could be that in season, when you look at them, it looks like this, and you see a guy like this. And it could be out of season, it looks more like this. And then you really want to make sure, and you're going to do that when you do this little palpation, you really want to make sure that you don't have anything lopsided, that you don't have anything that's just got a single testicle or something where the testicles haven't formed properly at all. And so if we assume that we've chosen a ram that's not going to bring any health problems to our flock, hopefully it has good confirmation and he can get used bred, the last leg of the stool is performance. Um, and this is often the factor that makes one ram more profitable than another. So what traits did you decide you wanted to change? So I'm going to buy a ram. Um, I need to know what I want to use them for. And so, you know, how am I going to decide if this potential ram has those traits? And it could be things like growth rate, muscling, total weight of lamb weaned, or labor requirements. Because if you have to pull every lamb, that's a problem. Um, so everyone wants to know what a ram is going to do in the flock. Is this the best ram? Is he going to do the best job? I know he looks good, right? I can see that. He's meaty, he's strong, he's got good, good confirmation. And wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of guarantee, some way of knowing what's going on? Because as we talked about in the beginning, genetics changes with every breeding. Even if the ram grew fast himself, Will, will he really produce fast-growing progeny? And this is where statistics come in. And so, um, and this is why things evolved that we started keeping track of, of statistics and doing more work with them to try and make better selection decisions. And so I'm gonna use a number born example just because it's a bit easier to think about. And so I wanna say I wanna buy a RAM that's gonna increase number born. And so I have two, two, two rams to choose from. And so here I've got ram A, and I know he's a twin. And here I've got ram B, and I know he's a triplet. And so if that's all I know, and I want to get more, a, more lambs born, I'm probably going to choose this triplet ram over here right? Because he's, you know, he's a triplet himself, so surely he would pass some of those genetics on. And so what if I also know that for this Ram A, that he, he was out of the seventh lambing of, of his mother, right? So the dam is here. She's had seven lambings. He's one of these twins. And so her history so far is this. At first lambing, she had one, then she had two, then she had one again, then she had three and three and three. And now that she's seven, she's had two. And so what if I also knew the history of the other ram? And so this ram's mother is a little younger. So her first lambing, she had one, then she had two, then she had one, and now she's had triplets. And so, now what do I think? Now it's really not clear, right? 
this this animal you know his mother's had a lot more opportunity to have lambs and have things happen than this one has this is the first time she's had triplets we're not sure what's going to happen next and if we compare these two ewes and look at their first four lambings their first four are exactly the same so now i'm not sure which one is best so i've added this extra information and i'm not sure i'm not sure if one will be better than the other so let's say i also have a little bit more information let's say i've got information on the dam of the sire of this ram and so in the case of ram a the first lambing she had twins then she had triplets 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 and triplets and in this case the grand the grandmother had a single first a single a twin and a single so now even though again these animals are younger than these ones over here these have had more opportunity i'm starting to feel like i'm going to have a better chance of getting more animals born from this ram a than ram b and so this takes a lot of time right to figure this out we have to keep track of all this stuff and what's going on and it is it's significantly changing my view of those two rams and how their genetics might come together for number born and so this is why why we have genetic evaluation programs and why these statistical models developed um, because basically in simple terms this is the evaluation numbers are are you know are formed by using the information on the animal itself its its sire its dam and all of its relatives and how the animal performed um, compared to other animals of other genetics in the same group under the same management and so by recording information for generations and using information on all the relatives we have a we can do a better job at predicting how the what the performance of the progeny is going to look like and so ideally if you're buying a ram there will be data related to what what you would like the ram to do in your flock it's important to ask questions about how the data is kept and calculated. Summary numbers are not always calculated the same way. So if numbers are from a particular program and, and you know, you're comparing rams from two different farms and they're using the same program, then you know that, that the summary numbers they're talking about are comparable. Um, most on-farm data collection programs summarize, but they don't use statistical models. So some of them interact with Genovis, which is the Canadian genetic evaluation system to bring those statistical evaluation numbers back to the on-farm software. And standardized performance testing or statistical models create repeatability. So it gives you a much better guarantee that if you buy a good RAM and he works well in your flock and you return to the same place for another, that it will be just as good or better. so why are genetic evaluations better similar to the example earlier they use information on all the relatives the numbers can be used across groups and flocks because environmental factors are accounted for in the statistical model and the other thing is that when you add data to a central database this creates breed benchmark numbers and so you know you've got your flock you've you know you're doing all kinds of things to make it work well and you've got some summary numbers and so are they good how do you know um, can how much better can you do how do you know um, and that's where you know these benchmark numbers help and having a central database helps is that you can see what the average is um, you know, those numbers can be reported that, you know, four Dorsets or four Ritos 
or four suffix, you know, the average um, growth rate is this, and the average number born and weaned is this. And so that, that gives you good numbers to decide what your target production should be. So what's a RAM worth? I don't know, right? I have no idea. And why is that? Um, I don't know because all sheep operations are a bit different. We don't have a lot of standardization in, in this industry. We've got a lot of different production systems and we've got a lot of different markets. And so this is something that you need to figure out for your farm, right? If you can get more lambs or if you can get faster growth or if you can get less mortality or less parasitism, what is it worth to you? You know, what are those numbers? What does it look like? Um, I can't really figure that out for you. I can give you some examples. And so here's an example from a slide set that was done in Quebec. Um, and they, they were using the trait of growth rate between weaning and market. So we're choosing between two RAMs. We've got RAM A and RAM B. So RAM B hasn't been tested. He's not on the, the Genovis program. He doesn't have the performance numbers. And so it's assumed that this RAM would be below average, below the average RAM on the, the performance program. And so they've, they've converted growth rate to days to market. And so if it costs, um, in the, I'm sorry about that, I'm jumping ahead. So they've changed it to days to market. And so in this case, um, this, it would take 0.1 more days for um, the progeny from this RAM on average to get to market because it's below average using these this growth rate. And so if you say that it costs 78 cents a day to keep the lamb, then when you do the math of 0.1 days and 78 cents, then it's eight cents in extra cost for the lamb if you use this ram. And if you say there's two lambs per litter, then it's 16 cents. Um, and if I assume that the ram bred 65 ewes or sired 130 lambs per year, it would cost $10.40 more um, to feed those animals compared to an average ram from the performance program. And over five years, it would cost me $52 more. So that yeah, doesn't seem so bad, right? But you know, if you're if you're selecting a performance tested ram, and you know, if if you're on the program and you're breeding rams to sell, you're not going to keep the average ram. Um, you're going to be selecting animals that are above average um, for yourself and to sell. And so, for Ram A, this is an example of a ram on the program, and he's in the top 10% of animals. And so if we convert his um, growth rate to days to market, then it's gonna take him 5.7 days less, or the progeny from him 5.7 days less on average to get to market than it would the average ram. And so at 78 cents a day again, that's $4.45 a lamb. And so if I'm talking two lambs a litter, it's $8.90 a litter. And for that same 65 ewes or 130 lambs, that's $578.50 a year. And if I keep that ram for five years, then there's a potential of almost $3,000 um, that, I, that I would save using him versus an average ram. And so another example um, is to use lambs mar marketed. And so if I, if I um, buy a ram because I want to improve that number, it, it could be as a result of better lamb vigor or more lambs born because um, you know, he has more semen and he can sire more ewes and, or maybe it's from survival. 
um, could be any any number of things. And so in, in this example, I've assumed that the RAM is going to breed 200 ewes. Okay, and that the average and that the market pr price is two hundred dollars, and so I've kept those things constant just so that we can see the effect of changing the number marketed. And so this is a really small change. So I've said that my old RAM, I was marketing one point five eight lambs per ewe on average, and that this new RAM is going to bump that up a titch, and I'm going to mark at one point six three lambs per ewe now. And so over, over 200 breedings, right, then on the old RAM side, when I multiply that out by 200, 1.58 marketed, $200, um, I'd be working with $63,200 in income. And if I use 1.63, do the same thing, I'd be working with 65,200. So that's $2,000 more or $10 a U, $10. And so, so it's just a small change. And it's one that if I'm not monitoring, if I'm not measuring, if I'm not actively choosing my RAM, I might not even notice, but it's having a significant impact. Um, and so it's important to think about that. Um, you know, it can have a large impact. It depends what you're buying your RAM for. And it could be that, you know, I, I was buying my RAM for something else and I wasn't monitoring the effect here and this decrease happened. And so now I've got $2,000 less because the new one's giving me 1.58 and I was getting 1.63 and so that's a significant difference. So back to, you know, what can you afford to pay for a RAM or what's the RAM worth? It's really gonna be an individual thing, um, but it's important to understand that there are, there can be consequences to, to change, good and bad, depending on, on selecting. And so you really wanna know, um, is that change happening? And you wanna actively be trying to, to get a little better performance. So the other thing to remember is that the genetics for performance are the foundation of your sheep flock. And so this, what this means is that if you do everything else right, genetics becomes your limiting factor. So if I am doing the best job at feeding, I'm doing the best job at making feed, I'm doing the best job at, um, managing the flock in general, um, the genetics have a top limit to performance. And when you reach it, it doesn't matter if I feed better, um, they won't grow faster. And an example I, I have from years ago is we, um, we, had some, we had some Rito animals and we imported some, um, some Texel embryos. And so, and they were put in Rito ewes. And so when those Texel lambs were born, they were raised with, they were raised by Rito ewes with Rito lambs from Rito ewes as well. And, you know, it didn't matter how well we fed, the Texel rams did not grow as fast as the Rito lambs didn't matter what we did. And then a year later, we have, you know, Texels and Ritos lambing together on grass. And on grass, those lambs were equal. They gained the same. And so there's genetics going on there in that, you know, on pasture, they're growing the same, I'm getting the same averages. In the barn, when you're feeding grain, those Texels were not equipped to use that grain. And so they couldn't take advantage, their genetics couldn't take advantage of that extra energy. Um, and so, so genetics becomes your limiting factor. You have to change the genetics um, to, 
to see improvements once your management is the best it can be. And so to put it in terms of a vehicle, I I like the the vehicle example because it's it's sort of a little easier to to understand or think about, I think. Um, and so what I've got here is I've got I've got this, you know, car that's like the size of a smart car on the bottom, and I've got a truck on the top. And so if my if what I need to do to make more profit is to use less gas, there's lots of things that I can do to this truck to make it more more efficient and use less gas. But at the end of the day, if I'm also trying to make this little car down here more efficient and use less ga gas, the car is always going to win, right? And that's the same as, as the genetics on the sheep. And then the same thing, you know, if what my objective is, is I need to pull, you know, a trailer full of sheep, even if I put, you know, a big engine, in this little car on the bottom and make all sorts of modifications, at the end of the day, if I do the same thing to this truck, the truck is going to do a better job and it's going to be more efficient at pulling that trailer than this car can ever be. And so, so, so at the end of the day, once you, you have your, your operation working and working well, ignoring performance and genetics can be the difference between being profitable and not. And so back to the same old question, what's a RAM worth? <laughs> and at the, you know, you have to figure it out. If you're just starting out and you've got 10 U's, you might not be able to afford a top of the line RAM. But you could get an above average RAM or at least an average RAM with good health and confirmation while you figure out how things work and start keeping the records to monitor flock performance. And then, you know, you're not actually using that RAM on very many use, and as the flock increases a little bit in size, then put more attention on the RAM. You can afford to put more into them. You know more about what you want and what you need, um, and then start to make progress that way. And what about if you have a larger flock and you're already established? And this is where the last slide comes in. Now you're refining your management. Are your flock genetics holding you back? You need to figure that out. And maybe even more importantly, how are you gonna make sure that you don't buy a RAM that reduces the performance that you already have? And so to do that, you really have to know, you know the performance on your own farm and determine what it's gonna be worth to you when you go and try and find a RAM. And so performance testing is complicated. Um, there's a lot of traits that make up an animal. Um, you know, when you see a, you always have one or two animals or a few animals that are really exceptional on your farm and you just wish you had a whole flock of those. And there's a lot of traits that make that animal that way. And so it's easiest if you can find a breeder who's selecting animals for the kinds of traits that you're interested in and maybe doing something similar with similar objectives. Um, who's using genetic evaluation numbers already. And this will make it easier for you to know what that performance um, could look like. And it means that you can get repeatable performance. If you buy a RAM today and you come back next year, um, you know that if, if the person says, you know, this animal is gonna be better than last year's RAM, and here's the numbers and why I think that, you know that it's pretty likely gonna be true. Um, and so, you know, if we remember this history of selection um, and the evolution of selection tools, none of these tools are wrong, but we need to build on them. And so we still need confirmation and we still need the things that were being evaluated in shows um, because we need that animal to be functional. Um, but we also, need to incorporate new technology going forward. Um, if you expect your operation to survive into the future, you really need to embrace um, some pieces of new technology as you go. Um, so, you know, what are you gonna do if you can't find RAMs 
like performance tested rams with Genovis evaluation numbers. And, and I throw this out there because there's not that many people participating. There's not that many breeders doing the work. Um, and often they say, you know, they, they don't see the point because not people aren't asking for it. People aren't saying they need it. Um, they maybe can't get extra value from that ram for having those numbers. Um, so it can be hard to find. And so if you do find it, I think there's an expectation that you, you need to be prepared to, to pay for that repeatable performance um, and, and to pay for someone else to do the extra work that you don't want to have to do. Um, but if you can't find one, the next best thing is, you know, are there on-farm records? Are they keeping some summaries at least? Again, you want to ask lots of questions so you understand what they're doing. Um, but but you need to know, you know, you need something is better than nothing always, especially if you want to go back and another time and expect to get a, an equal RAM or hopefully better RAM. And so the other thing you can do um, is you can, you know, when you monitor the performance of that RAM at home, if you use your old RAM and a new RAM to breed groups of ewes at the same time, so that they're having lambs at the same time in the same lambing group, then you'll get an idea, you can compare how well those lambs did from each of those rams and see if your new ram really is better than your old ram. So, sounds like a lot of work and and it is a lot of work um, so any efficiencies that you can find through software programs and you know and any way to make data collection and analysis easier is well worth it because one of the problems we have is is to do well in the sheep industry little details matter and because it's not heavily structured where everything works the same way you know, if you take something like the chicken industry, um, if I was, you know, raising chickens, I buy all of my genetics. There's no genetic choices that go on. Those birds arrive ready to grow and I do one thing. And we don't have that in the sheep industry. We have to figure all those things out. And so, so the details do matter. So, you know, if we remember that if we're keeping replacements in three generations, seven eighths of the genetics will be for my RAM choices. So I need some numbers. I need, I need something to be able to monitor my management decisions anyway, and I can use some of the same information to ensure that the genetics, I'm the genetic framework that I'm building through these generations um, is what I want and that it's gonna respond to the good management that I'm gonna give it. And then another thing to think about too is back to this, what is that RAM gonna be used for? If you're buying a RAM to just sire market lambs rather than replacement use, then you're only talking about one generation because you're not gonna keep any of those lambs as replacements in your flock. You're gonna sell them all. They're all gonna to go to market. So I only have to worry about what's gonna be transferred in one generation from this ram to these lambs. And so if I have a, a flock of ewes that are more maternal traits, um, and so with maternal traits, they tend to be negatively correlated to uh, carcass traits and days to market. So then I can gain some efficiency in my system and boost my you know average daily gain and muscling in my lambs by using a, a terminal sire that's going to give me that growth rate and muscling change in one generation right there in the lambs. And so are you getting the most from genetics? Um, there's no way around it. You need to invest some time and some money into your ram selection. Um, when you actually go to pick out a ram, Make sure you do the easy part. The easy part is confirmation. These, these are things you can see, right? If you can see it, it's, it's much easier because you, you, know, you don't have to keep a whole bunch of records because you can see the problem or the, you know, the good trait right there in front of you. 
um, you know, look up the CSBA confirmation booklet. Make sure that you have a really good handle on what good confirmation looks like so that it's easy to spot it when you're trying to see a whole bunch of things at once in a short amount of time on the farm. Make sure you put your hands on the ram. Um, you know, you want to make sure the teeth are good. You want to feel that back. You want to feel, you know, that muscles are there or not there. And you really want to get your hands on the testicles and make sure that he can do the job you're buying him for. Um, so you want to check them over. You want to ask questions about health and diseases on the farm. You want to make sure it's going to fit into the problems that you have. Um, make sure you have your quarantine plan set up prior to going. Um, and and you want to make sure you're buying your ram soon enough. If you need to use a ram two weeks from now, you're way too late. You need to quarantine for at least 30 days. You need time for that ram to adjust, to make sure that he's, you know, eating and adjusted before he goes out and uh, and breeds ewes. Um, and finally, ask about performance. What's measured? What does the breeder select for? Um, figure out what you can afford to pay for performance um, and have a plan to ramp, to monitor that, that ram when you get back so you know what impact that ram has had on your flock. And so thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, I think there's still a bit of time if, if anybody has any questions.